This is a Relay Project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, welcome to this episode of Real Talk. Whether you're catching this on YouTube or via our podcast, maybe you're streaming the audio on the Mixler live streaming audio app presented by California Closets. We welcome you uh, to what will be a fast moving show in just a second. Dr. Michael Geis will join us from the University of Ottawa. He's like the guy that you want to talk to in Canada if you want solid, informed insight on online news, uh, basically where the industry is going, internet and e-commerce law. That's this guy's wheelhouse. We're going to talk about Canada's deal, the federal government's deal with Google. The good news is you'll be able to get news on your device, on your tablet, your phone, your laptop, just like before. Remember the threat that Google was making? You, you've probably noticed that you haven't been able to share links to stories that have caught your attention on, on, on Facebook or on Instagram. It's, it's been a real pain in the ass, quite frankly, for news creators, most especially the big, the major news corporations across Canada. So the feds have struck a deal largely the same deal they could have struck a year ago. So did Ottawa blow it? Or is that just oversimplifying this story? We'll ask that of Dr. Geist in just a second. You may have seen Charles Adler video trending over the weekend, hundreds of thousands of views as he scoffs, as he laughs away poll results from David Coletto at Abacus Data showing that uh, more Canadians believe that Pierre Polyev would uh, set the table for them to have an affordable, a more affordable life than any of the other federal political parties. Charles doesn't think so. We'll ask him why. And then... We'll talk business. We'll talk bottom lines. It's the first Monday of the month, which means the Alberta Chambers of Commerce president and CEO, Shauna Feth, will join me in studio. We're going to talk about the carbon tax impact on business. We're going to talk about that huge deal, like a $10 billion deal, Dow Chemicals, the feds. You saw Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland in Alberta making that announcement last week. We'll talk about the implications of that. And of course, it's shop local season. So we'll get into that with the Alberta Chambers CEO. Speaking of business, in your own personal business, the way that you earn your money, are you looking for a change? Maybe it's a, a New Year's resolution type thing. You're sick and tired of that job that you, you wake up early for, but you just can't stand. You're dreaming about starting a new career. What about being your own boss, running a thriving business, and leaving cubicle life behind for good? If that sounds pretty good, plus the idea of unlimited earning potential catches your attention, a career in real estate could very well be your perfect match. You can get started today by enrolling with Rello. Rello's Alberta's top real estate school and they want to support you every single step of the way from studying for your exam to getting your license and it doesn't stop there either. With Rello, you can study 100% online as well on your own schedule, which a lot of people love, like Real Talker Graham. He wrote in last week to tell us about his graduation from Rello. Congrats, Graham. Right now, be like Graham and save 20% off any Rello course with the exclusive promo code Real Talk. That's all one word. The promo code Real Talk knocks 20% off any course at Rello.ca. Dr. Michael Geist is a law professor at the University of Ottawa. That's where he holds the Canada Research Chair for Internet and E-Commerce Law. He's been writing about Ottawa's negotiations with the tech giants, including Google, on his blog at michaelgeist.ca. Kind enough to join us this morning on the show. Doc, thanks for making time for us. It's nice to see your face. Oh, it's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is something like beautifully ironic about a guy that's that's uh, an expert in internet and e-commerce law, yet you're surrounded by hardcover books and paperbacks and all kinds of things. Are you a memorabilia guy? You love the feel of a book? How are you wired? No, I'm just a law professor who ends up uh, over a couple decades, ends up accumulating a whole lot and uh, it keeps ignoring my wife who says to please clean things up. Oh, I love it. That's, that's a great background. That's the type of background that people fake if they don't have it for real. And, and yours is real. So nicely done. Hey, Michael, you know, we see a lot of people criticizing uh, this deal that Ottawa struck with Google. Uh, correct me if I'm missing any major details. Basically, Google's going to give Canadian news corporations $100 million a year as, as part of kind of what would you call it, like a, a revenue or profit sharing agreement. Basically, people are saying they're the ones creating the news. They should be compensated for it because Google's benefiting from selling advertising. Can you take us into the agreement? 
Sure. So, I mean, listen, I think the fact that there is an agreement is good news. Uh, you know, the alternative would have been catastrophic for many Canadian news outlets, having already lost news links and deals with Meta, Facebook and Instagram to if the same thing happened with Google. I think it would have been pretty disastrous and it would have been bad for ordinary Canadians as well. It's, you know, we rely on Google for basic search. And if that search is not nearly as good because news links have been removed, that's not a good thing. Uh, that said, this particular deal isn't nearly as good as I think the government would like to suggest that it is. In fact, I think there are many news outlets that end up worse even out of this deal alone than they were before the legislation started. And the basic premise or the basic outline of the deal is, as you suggest, Google is going to pay $100 million to uh, a single entity. It's going to work a lot like a fund, and it'll be up to that entity. It'll be a collective or a fund that will then allocate or distribute out that money. The expectation is that about three quarters of that money will go to broadcasters, only about a quarter of it will go to print and digital publishers, although the government may step in there as well to try to uh, adjust a little bit what the allocation looks like. But that's a deal that Google had on the table over a year ago, and the government consistently rejected it in favor of legislation that's very different. And the government ultimately caved, I think, on these issues to try to bring Google on side. So is it, was there any benefit to the Ottawa waiting a year? I mean, or is this basically, did, did we eat crow? No, I think they I think they're they're not saying they're eating crow, but I think it's pretty clear that they did. You know, they insisted for a long time that they would not get directly involved in the negotiations. These would be between Google and the media outlets. In the end, they actually did directly negotiate it. They said there would be a myriad of deals between Google and all these various companies. In the end, Google's just cutting a single check. And we should note that that hundred million is in fact uh, we're told cash, but Google already had deals with large numbers of different outlets, some speculating worth as much as $50 million. And if that's the case, then we're not talking about that much new money. We're talking about basically half of it is is new money. And since, as I say, as perhaps as much as three quarters of it will go to broadcasters, if you're a print publisher, if you're post media, if you're a tour star, and you already had deals with these with some a company like Google, you may find that you end up with less, which helps actually explain why tour star for one has already come out against this particular agreement. Yeah, and the, yeah, okay. So basically, the the, the hundred million dollars means that anything that was being doled out before is done, right? Like this is this is the the hundred million is the whole wackadoodle. That's what they're going to pay once a year. So any uh, pre existing agreement is now null and void. Exactly. Google will roll in what they were paying previously into that hundred million. So if you had a, a lucrative deal and we're led to believe these are not open, transparent deals, but uh, certainly there's a lot of speculation that especially with some of the larger players, these deals were worth quite a lot. Suddenly now you're in a situation where you're simply sharing a portion of a broader, a larger amount of money to be sure but your share of that is likely to be smaller than what you were getting before. And that doesn't even include the harm that that has occurred due to this legislation with Meta walking away from, from this bill or walking away from news links in Canada. And so the value of their deals is long gone. The value of their links is, is now lost. And of course, the legislation doesn't generate any revenue from them at all. Yeah. Okay. So let's be clear. So this has nothing to do. We say Meta, Facebook, Instagram. This has nothing to do with them. They're not included in this. There's not a win here. That's still in limbo, right? That's right. I mean, you know, there there were reports over the weekend that the government has asked Meta to come back to the table. So they're they're hoping that perhaps this is a window. And while Meta has been pretty insistent that they view news differently than Google, which is why it was always clear that there was the possibility of a Google deal, but Meta was far less likely. Uh, they've made it pretty clear that they're not looking to pay much for much of anything for news, which reflects the value that they associated with it. And that's not to say that the news isn't important. It's simply from an economic perspective on that platform. They have been blocking now for months and found that user activity hasn't really changed, that people spend the same amount of time on their platforms looking at pictures of friends or memes or whatever it is that they're following. And so the notion that now they need to pay for the links to this news when they're not even the ones doing the posting, it's obviously the publishers themselves that that many times do those postings and it's links that refer the traffic back. They say they're not interested in that. So we'll see. The fact that the government was willing basically to upend and overhaul its legislation to get a deal with Google suggests that they may well be willing to do the same for Meta. The question is, would they be willing to basically say, you're not going to be on the hook for much 
much, if anything, from a financial perspective, just please turn the links back on because it's having a real negative effect. Does the, does Ottawa have any leverage here? No, not really. Uh, they, you know, that they to the extent to which Meta looks at this and says it's it, it doesn't really have a negative impact, then then not at all. You listen, there are some who say that you know what has resulted on those platforms is more misinformation that that authoritative sources are lost, and surely some users were happy to be able to share that kind of information. So I think all things being equal, Meta would be would be happy to have it. You know, I've heard the government say that. Meta is walking away from news around the world, trying to suggest that somehow what we've seen in Canada is just commonplace elsewhere. But the reality is that, of course, that's not really what's taking place. They are walking away from news or de-emphasizing news in many other countries. But there's only one amongst the large democratic countries that finds its news blocked, and that's Canada. And that's because we're the only ones that have moved forward with legislation in this way. So, yeah, can you compare? I mean, it's sometimes a fool's errand to compare Canada and the U.S. The, the populations aren't even comparable. Uh, the economies aren't even comparable. There, there's a whole bunch of areas where we're not comparable. We're still very proud to be Canadian, of course. Uh, but uh, how are they handling things? Or could you compare it like at a high level, big picture on why the Canadian government has, has sort of dug in its heels on this and, and maybe what the U.S. or what the Americans are doing differently? Yeah, sure. It's an interesting question. I, I think there's a couple of things worth highlighting. First, you know, in Canada, in addition to this legislation, we probably should note that the government also has assortment of other programs, including most notably the Labor Journalism Tax Credit, which has provided hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, what are accredited news organizations, qualified Canadian journalism organizations is the official title, but that's limited to print and some digital. And in fact, in the fall economic statement, they more than doubled the amount available per journalist. It, it felt very much like a means of compensating for the blunder that was this legislation and the lost revenue by saying, well, we'll try to make it up to some of these entities by way of, of tax credits. The idea in the U.S. that that a government would get so directly involved in funding this way, I think, is anathema to sort of the separation between government and, and an independent press. So we don't see that. We have seen at least a couple of proposals that have tried to move down the direction of can there be a facilitation of negotiation between the platforms and media outlets, uh, a bill in California, as well as a federal proposal. Neither have advanced all that far, but it is certainly possible that that they may move in that direction. But I think Canada will likely be a bit of a cautionary tale. And it will make clear that, yes, some platforms, or at least one platform, Google, is willing to pay something. But at the same time, this is not risk-free legislation. And it, it feels as if the government went into this thinking this was just going to be easy. You put forward the bill. These companies are going to write a check and we're heroes. And of course, uh, a, you know, a, a year and a half later after they introduced that bill, it's been pretty disastrous in, in many respects. And I think what we saw last week was an attempt to salvage the legislation from being just an, a complete catastrophe had Google walked away. I don't want to compare the two industries like like news, journalism and, and transportation or ride hiring. But it kind of reminds me like the big tech giants attitudes to all this about how how Uber just rolled into most municipalities. I mean, quite frankly, around the world, but in particular, saw it in Western Canada. And city councils did everything they could to rattle their sabers and try to save the value, preserve the value of taxi licenses and all types of things. And Uber just laughed, uh, basically with very deep pockets allocated for 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 litigation. And and, and I can't uh, think of off the top of my head a, a single jurisdiction where Uber lost and left. I know it's not everywhere, but for the most part, it won. It, it seems to me to just be a bit of a losing effort on on this front as well. Like it, when you compare Canada, would you agree or? Yeah, I get. Listen, I I don't think that we we live in a world or should live in a world where tech companies just because they're big or just because they're tech companies live outside the scope of regulation. Agreed. Uh, but I think what we need is smart regulation. And I think one of the sources of frustration with the government's approach on internet regulation, both this bill, the online news bill, but also the streaming bill that they had that raised a lot of concerns, uh, is that I think they went about it the wrong way. You know, I think they they tr treated these companies almost like a policy ATM looking to create a, a bunch of withdrawals to fund various policy objectives. And, you know, in some ways profiting from uh, from some of the misconduct that might exist from some of those co those companies. You know, there are concerns around how some of these companies use our personal information 
information about competitive abuses in the marketplace. And rather than curtailing the privacy abuses or curtailing the competitive uh, competitive abuses that may take place, they instead sought to profit from them by basically saying, all right, fine, that, that will put towards the back in terms of what we make, a, we identify as a legislative priority. And instead, we just want you to cut some checks to help some of these other uh, companies or sectors that are struggling. And, and I would have thought that the, the far better approach would have been to prioritize some of the harms, would have been to prioritize privacy and competition and the like. And instead, the government chose really to to look for potential payoffs that came out of these other other bills. Does Is part of that also that a government needs to maybe reflect citizens' priorities? I mean, maybe that's kind of oversimplifying it, but I, I, I guess I just I look around and and if your perspective is that, that government, a big role of government is to protect its people uh, without becoming some sort of a nanny state, uh, then we could go down that road. But uh, people are willingly, I think by now, people understand what surrendering your privacy or surrendering or providing, gladly providing your personal information, what the implications are. Maybe not to the most fulsome extent, but most people understand that Facebook and Instagram doesn't have your best interests in mind. You are the product. It is monetizing what you provide. But the average Canadian, and I'd argue the average person around the world, doesn't actually seem to care very much about it. So why should government? Well, certainly, I mean, you're, it's a trade-off clearly there many people are willing to make. I don't know that people always recognize the full scope of of uh, some of the what's sometimes referred to as surveillance capitalism that sometimes takes place, the full scope of how much data is being collected and how it's being used, whether they would make different choices if they were aware, I think is a good question. But I think one of the real frustrations with the way the government approached this is that it was all politics over policy. And, you know, if I think of, let's say, in the news context, you had online digital first news publications warning up and down that there were a lot of risks associated with this legislation, that, that they were deeply worried that the worst case scenario would well come to pass. And they 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 tried to speak out, but you know, the government didn't really want to hear from them. Frankly, they didn't even want to they didn't want to hear from the platforms either. In fact, when the House of Commons was conducting its hearings at one stage, it wasn't even going to hear from Meta at all. And so if you are captured in the sense, I in that sense, I appeared before a heritage committee just last week and they were trying to focus on the tactics of tech companies. And I made the argument that, listen, if you take a look at who lobbied the most for this legislation, it was an entity called News Media Canada, where it had the most number of registered lobbyist meetings with, and they represent obviously the, the print sector. And the ri bigger risk is not some of these tactics, it's regulatory capture. It's that if you're only listening to different lobby groups and that's the outcome that you get, you run the risk of missing some of the risks or potential negative consequences that come from the legislation. And I think that's exactly what happened in the case of online news. Uh, we're talking to Dr. Michael Geist. Uh, you do an amazing job, by the way. You deserve credit for the amount that you write, uh, the amount of articles that you publish. MichaelGeist.ca will link to it in the show notes on the podcast and on YouTube. I uh, just want to ask you about what, you know, what's being described as a bailout. The government announced, I think it was last week, plans to cover about a third uh, up to a maximum cap of, of journalist costs, basically for some news outlets, not the broadcasters, but certainly the print outlets, uh, as, as the feds basically more than double the tax credit per employee, uh, depending on your perspective on this, depending on, on how hardwired you are to support a free market or, or to, to believe that a federal government needs to do what it can to preserve the fourth estate and the value that, that good, reputable journalism brings to a society. Um, I've seen some people say the government needs to stay out of business. I've seen other people say the government needs to do everything it can uh, to try to save this industry. Uh, and, I've, and I've seen you, I read your piece, talking about how Oftentimes, government investment, or if you want to call it a bailout in industries like this, can actually erode public trust in those industries. So, so how do you evaluate that news from Ottawa? Yeah, no, I think that last point is exactly where a lot of the risks lie. You know, the government presents this typically as sort of supporting uh, what is an absolute necessity in society, which is a strong, viable, independent press. And I think one of the real concerns that arises in that context is that uh, that if you have government so directly involved, so responsible for some of the money associated with all of this, that you you absolutely run the risk of of losing that independence. And I think we've seen that play out. I think we saw it play out, frankly, with the online news bill, where the coverage that that bill received from 
some of the largest beneficiaries or hope purported beneficiaries of this bill, they were more than happy to criticize the government on just about anything. But when it came to a potential payoff from this legislation, they were all in. And and I think that's that's a really risky approach to take. And so I am sensitive and supportive of the view that we need a viable press that functions effectively. But the government becoming such an important part of the coverage raises real risks. You know, listen, if you're if you're a media entity and you're now getting 35 percent of your labor costs covered for journalists covered by the government. And let's say you have an opposition party that runs against that policy in an upcoming election. Is that going to skew your coverage, knowing that it has huge economic implications for your business? I frankly think the answer is that in many instances, it obviously will. Perhaps not by individual journalists, but certainly for the entities themselves. Well, of course. And and, and even if and, and we'll wrap on this point, Michael, like, you know, even if you are a, like a national columnist, for example, uh, how does that not whether or not you spell it out? Uh, how is that not going to influence? I mean, if, if, you, if you believe that the, that one political party would would allow you to preserve your career and the other would let you hang, metaphorically speaking, uh, how is that not going to some subconsciously, subtly or otherwise impact your perspective on it? How might this let me just ask you this in closing. And this is asking you to speculate. How might this whole thing look differently, including the whole defund the CBC movement and everything else under a prime minister Poliev? Yeah, no, good question. Uh, well, listen, their, their position on. The public broadcaster is pretty well known. And and I think the CBC, frankly, hasn't done themselves any favors on this. They, they've they lined up for potential payments along the way, even though this, I thought, was actually a perfect example for them to demonstrate why there might be value in a public broadcaster, that, that everyone should have access to credible, reliable news without a paywall. That's what the public is paying for. And rather than saying, hey, we want to get paid for news links, what they ought to be saying is we want to ensure that 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 content that the Canadian public's already paid for is as broadly and widely disseminated as possible. And yet that's not the approach that that they took. So I think that's a potential change. You know, it will be interesting to see you know, whether this becomes a, a core point of, of a new government, if in fact there is a new government. They've certainly said on the on the issues associated with broadcasting, Bill C-11, that would be an issue. And I could well imagine that a different government might well say, listen, we want to find ways to provide some mechanism of support, that if it's just the free market, there may well be some lost news and that may have some real implications. But government getting this directly involved has itself real implications, and we've got to identify different ways of doing it. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Michael Geist is uh, a professor, a law professor at the University of Ottawa. That's where he's the uh, Canada Research Chair, holds it there for Internet and e-commerce law. You can read more about what he does. I encourage you to. Great insights from a number of different angles, and not just on C-18. I mean, we don't even have time to get into his piece on accountability and anti-Semitism and a whole lot of other stuff. Again, that's michaelgeist.ca. Always enjoy chatting with you, my man. Thanks for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks so much yeah, for having you me. Yeah, you bet. Uh, let us know, Real Talkers, how this is resonating with you. Um, I thought that was interesting insight as well. He's saying basically the, the usage, uh, Canadians' use of Facebook hasn't really changed much, uh, despite the fact that they haven't been able to share it. You haven't been able to share news articles and pieces on that. It probably just changes people's I, – I don't know, Johnny. Do you think that it – does it drive people – like, does somebody all of a sudden go to – you know, globeandmail.com well, instead you? of linking to it off Facebook. I mean, <laughs> I, my thing is... I mean, we already do that. We already I, subscribe. Yeah, like We're already say, into that. I but, never would you. I would yeah. never go to Facebook to get no. the news links, but a lot of people did. And I posed that question to my partner. Like, hey, hey have you been going to somewhere else for news? What'd She's she like, say? not really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's the average person. I don't think this... I, I think the doctor's right, and so are you. Like, we just... We ain't crow on this. Like the government, Canada, trying to, you know, arch their backs up and get this money. Yeah. It was not well thought through. And they should have sat down with Meta and, and went back and forth, not just put up this wall like and it's like the doctor said. They thought they were just going to get written a check, right? I thought it was interesting that he said, you know, when you say, what what leverage does Ottawa have? He's like, zero. basically zero. <laughs> like what, what well, is... I was trying to think of it from what what, <laughs> what, what threat can you make? Nothing. It, and you know what? I, I don't have a lot of sympathy. I want journalists to be paid, but I have no sympathy for, I won't say names, but you know, CTV, Bell Media, large corporations that have been getting... Post Media is the biggest one. They've Post Media too. Shovel getting fat as a hog off journalists' hard work yep. for years and years, and now 
they realize they're not making as much money and they got to pay journalists. We got to find other ways to make money. And I want journalists to get paid, but but it's also th- like, this is not the way. People have been getting people have been used to, and this is like that unpopular. Remember when you know former Alberta Premier Jim Prentice, may he rest in peace, mm. paid the price politically for telling people to look in the mirror, except for he was right. Yeah, he was correct about that. And and you think like so here's our look in the mirror moment is that back in the day, uh, if you can remember, kids, uh, there was once a time where Sit there down. were no, I was talking to Wyatt, our eight-year-old, about this. I said there, there were no smartphones, there were no tablets, no iPads. He's like, what did you do? Well, the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, the, the, the little <laughs> paper delivery kid, you know, used to sort of roll them up with elastic bands and throw them on the front lawn. And if you didn't pay for a subscription to the newspaper, yeah. you'd either steal your neighbors or you'd go to the coffee shop. You'd steal theirs or you'd read it there. Mm-hmm. So there was no way to just get it for free but people have become accustomed now to having sure. you'll see a lot of times uh, I'll think of a journalist that'll share a, a feature that they've done or share some reporting they've done and then people will complain in the comments and say oh it's behind a paywall yeah, it's like well yeah it's like if I open a restaurant I say come check it out and people say oh we have to pay for the food <laughs> well yeah you know but people have become yeah. so accustomed to getting it for free of course and the big challenge now for the media outlets is how do you maintain these newsrooms these huge staffs how do you send people to go cover COP the climate conference how do you send people into courtrooms mm-hmm. to sit there for hours to cover a trial You're trying to find extra dollars it costs I get money. It. So. But like, yeah, it's funny when uh, young people ask me what we did before smartphones nowadays. I said, we had dumb phones. We were dumb. But, <laughs> but anyways, it's the same way. And I'm accustomed to it too now. I, I, I walk into hotel lobbies now and if they don't have the news on, I'm like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's we're so accustomed to getting news for free all around us, everywhere we are. We don't wait for the paper anymore, obviously. But yeah, I, I, they just went about this wrong. They should have sent... You know, a message to someone said, hey, let's all get together. Let's bang this out. See how we can both make some money here. Yeah. Maybe when people subscribe to a news organization's uh, Facebook page and then they want to see links from that page in their feed, they pay an extra dollar a month. That's or interesting. They could have come up with a million different ways than to say, F you guys, we're just going to take everything away, which totally blew up in their face. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to Charles Hathor. Oh, we'll ask him about this. Plus, uh, he's got a, a video he released. It's just like a selfie video on his phone over the weekend. Has like almost 300,000 views. He's just laughing at polling results around Pierre Polyev. I'm going to ask him what he thinks is so funny about it coming up in just a second. But I wanted to put this on your radar. If you missed our Real Talk Roundtable table. Back on Thursday, just a few days ago, we welcomed uh, the president of Athabasca University, Dr. Alex Clark, plus Dr. Jennifer Nop Sahota, and a recent graduate from their. This we're talking about nurse practitioners in the province of Alberta, NPs, and uh, Alberta. Its government is, is, I think, in in one way, uh, and there will be a number of different approaches. There has to be to try to fix healthcare. One of them to address the doctor shortages is to empower and equip nurse practitioners to do more work on their own. Alberta is basically encouraging NPs to open their own clinics. The family doctors do not love the plan. So we get into it with these three. Again, that's the trio from Athabasca University. Make sure you check it out if you're curious uh, or if you're particularly intrigued by changes to Alberta's healthcare delivery system. That's a Real Talk roundtable you won't want to miss. And you can learn more about the nurse practitioner program at Athabasca University by visiting AthabascaU.ca. We also wanted to let you know that conversations here on Real Talk today would not be happening without the support of partners like our friends at Friesen Brothers. And this is the time of year where they know your family is starting to think about your holiday plan. There's a few different things we'll point out. Number one, their Christmas boxes. If you want to leave the work to their Red Seal chefs so you can socialize and have quality time with your family and friends, you can get your orders in today either in store or at Friesen.com. They've also got Christmas gift boxes which can be totally customized. A fantastic idea for that person in your life that seems to already have everything. And then don't forget, Friesen Brothers is inviting kids to help them find Jerome the Gnome a home for Christmas. He's moving around the store in the weeks leading up to the holiday for your chance to win Jerome and his candy stash. Kids just need to fill in an entry form at customer service saying where they saw Jerome the Gnome. They're going to draw a winner for each Friesen Brothers store, all 16 of them on December 22nd. You can find more information at Friesen.com slash gnome. 
That's, of course, (laughs) G-N-O-M-E, Jerome the Gnome. Uh, Every Monday, or at least the first episode of every week, we get to hang out with our good pal Charles Adler. And before we get to Chuck, we want to play this video. It's less than two minutes. It's basically him freewheeling. This is his brand of Canadian common sense, which has earned him, of course, an RTDNA Lifetime Achievement Award over decades of service on the airwaves. Here's Charles Adler over the weekend. (laughs) Oh, God. I can't. I have so much respect for David Coletto of Abacus Data. He's one of the best. He's one of the most hardworking. He's he's diligent. He's smart. He's worldly. He's got a wonderful dog named Chestnut. He loves dogs probably as much as I do, if that's possible. But holy Christ. His latest poll indicates that a huge percentage of Canadians believes that if Pierre Polyev becomes Prime Minister Polyev, Canada becomes a much more affordable country. I am not here to dump on Canadians, any Canadians, anywhere. I don't care about their religious beliefs or their political beliefs or any of the boxes you want to check off. I'm not like that. But how? I don't mean to call them gullible. I, but I, I just, I wish I could buy into that. If I believed for even a minute that Polyev could make the country more affordable, I, I, I get that at the rallies he does this, ax the tax, ax the carbon tax, but there's not a smart person I know who understands economics, who believes that if the carbon taxes were all axed, it wouldn't amount to a piss in the ocean, <laughs> any ocean, even the smaller oceans, for crying out loud. <laughs> By the way, if Canadians, in masses of Canadians really believe that Canada would become more affordable with a poly of government, why aren't they marching in, on Ottawa? Why aren't they driving their, their trucks and, and, and cars and, and scooters? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Who believes this stuff? Apparently, many people do. I, you know, on some level, I wish I were one of them. Well, that's a couple of minutes that matter to me, hopefully to you. Thank you for your generosity, as always. I'm Charles Adler. So there he is, and a quarter million people, more than that, in fact, uh, enjoyed that video. Uh, Why do you think it resonated? I mean, uh, no offense to you. Nothing particular. <laughs> nothing. Nothing particularly profound. You're just laughing off poll results and calling people gullible. I, you know, I, I, I love you so much. I, I think of you as my son, uh, and 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 my partner and, and stuff like that. But I love the way you asked the question. That, you know, why do you think we're we're almost at I guess two hundred eighty eighty five thousand people? So we'll have three hundred thousand within a you know an hour or so. Anyhow, um, it doesn't matter what the actual number is. The point is it, it did resonate. But the way you asked the question, of why, why do you think that what you're doing resonates? Well, I guess there's, I've got some evidence over half a century <laughs> that people buy what I'll call my unsophisticated ways. I mean, last week at this time, I was getting into some bathroom humor, and I got the impression you were you know, telling me to try to tap it down. And, hey, I, I'm not Michael Geist. Michael Geist is a brilliant, urbane a sophisticated guy, I understand at least, I don't know, 15 or 16% of what he says. I really admire him. I watch the whole thing. Um, I love the way you, you, you humanize the stuff about paywalls. Mm. I mean, it's one of the reasons you're a great communicator. You say, wait a minute, people get upset because a, a journalist puts something on, on X or Facebook or TikTok or whatever, and there's a link, and you go to the link at the Toronto Star or the Edmonton Journal or whatever, and you find out there's a paywall there, and you get all upset. Why am I not getting this for nothing? And you popularized it better than anyone I've, I've ever heard. You said, you know, when a restaurateur puts out a notice that he's got some fabulous pasta and, uh, and, and people go to the restaurant, if they don't expect to pay for it, who the hell needs them? Mm. You know, uh, people have to do hard work to do what it is that you want and they expect to be paid. Is this, has this become a radical concept? Because if it's radical, if, if the idea that people getting paid for their work is radical, hello Mao Zedong, mm. hello communist China, goodbye Canada, goodbye the United States, 
goodbye to capitalism, goodbye to free enterprise, goodbye to opportunity, creativity, and most important, goodbye to laughter. Have you ever seen any commentary in the Mao Zedong era, okay, whether we're talking about before the People's Revolution, after the People's Revolution, before the, uh, what was it called, the Cultural Revolution, where uh, people were turning in their own professors, their own parents, their own brothers and, and sisters. Did you, did you see any commentary where anybody was laughing? And put aside everything I said in that polyeth thing, the fact that I can sit here, okay, and laugh about a, a poll that says uh, significant millions of people believe that, you know, when they go to the supermarket, when they go to buy a house, when they go to buy a car or a truck or a van or an RV or whatever, you know, go go buy, you know, cr Christmas uh, dinners at Friesen Brothers, the, the prices are going to be dramatically down. Why? Because Pierre Polyev is the is the prime minister i give i give him and i give the conservatives full credit if they have bamboozled canadians into really believing that life changes dramatically with a polyev government you know a tip of the chapeau man that is that is great work but from my perspective it's a laugher so you know pe people would say and i and i and i've read you know what some of your critics have to say in, in the replies yeah. there's like a thousand replies to it some of not, them not all of them think i have dementia by the way well I, <laughs> I mean, like, well, there's this guy here that just thinks you're drunk or high, uh, sure, which, you know, sure. that's fine, too. It was over the weekend. I mean, maybe you were. I don't know. But, maybe uh, I you was. Know, you know, but, <laughs> well, let me, let me, this, so I'm picking this one at random. Okay. This is at random. This is a guy by the name of Leonard uh, who says, okay. you know, Chuck, I get that you're incensed about the way Canada has turned extreme left. People have lost extreme left, extreme left, really? Anyway, back to Leonard's message. He says, instead of calling out the politicians you support who have caused this destruction, you've chosen to post this diatribe. And then he takes a few shots of you, uh, shots at you. And then he says, but you contradict yourself with your condescension of Canadians. You call us gullible, but you've lost all critical thinking. He says, you know, these politicians, Trudeau, he says the NDP's support of Trudeau, the lives of millions of Canadians have been made miserable, dangerously unaffordable affordable, uh, causing skyrocketing, in, 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 skyrocketing inflation, crime, bankruptcies, divisiveness, mental health problems, the loss of our freedoms. I mean, I might ask Leonard what freedoms he's lost, but I digress. He says, you know, perhaps, Chuck, it's time for you to retire, never come back so our lives can improve. That from Leonard, who, who puts it all out there. But generally speaking, he's saying at a time where of the affordability crisis is, as polling suggests, number one on people's list of concerns and political priorities, you're scoffing at the leader of the opposition without suggesting the prime minister should look in the mirror. Isn't it a fair point? It, it, it is a fair point if you know nothing. If you don't know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but many points are fair when the receiver doesn't know what the deliverer is talking about, okay? So many countries around the world have no carbon tax, okay? They are carbon tax heaven. For, for those people who think that the carbon tax is, you know, choking us to death, there are many countries where you will feel free because there's no carbon tax. And guess what? The cucumbers are even more expensive than they are in Canada. And the apples, and the blueberries, and the gasoline, and the homes, and, 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 and. So he has sold people a bill of goods that the carbon tax is responsible for everything, Trudeau and his team created the carbon tax. Therefore, inflation is just inflation. The problem is you go around the world where there is massive amounts of inflation, far worse than Canada without a carbon tax. And Leonard, at that point, I guess has got to go get a drink. Have a drink, Leonard. I'm not retiring, but you go have a drink. In fact, I'll pay for it. Send me the bill. Oh, we we could have like we could yeah we could uh, Leonard may have expensive taste. Uh, oh, he's got a blue check mark, so he can afford. Canadians, he's got a blue have, check been, Canadians, <laughs> Canadians have been generous with me, and I'm convinced they want me to be generous with Leonard. And by the way, I don't dump on Canadians. I mean, I get this all the time. I, I, when I got into the fight with Kenny, oh, I'm dumping on all Albertans because I'm dumping on Jason Kenny. Are you kidding me? We're in a democracy here. No one person represents everyone. Regardless of who you vote for, let's say you voted for Danielle Smith instead of Rachel Knockley. That doesn't mean that Danielle Smith owns your heart. And that doesn't mean that Danielle Smith represents everyone in Alberta. No more than Rachel Knockley would if she were elected premier. Well, yeah, let so, me... Sorry, let but, me... But, but, I, but I'm not dumping on Canadians. I'm, I'm, I said in the... When I said gullible, I said I'm not saying that they're gullible. 
What I really am saying, bottom line, in terms of messaging is Pierre Polyev's messaging, conservative messaging, has been extremely effective. Liberal messaging has been extremely ineffective. And yes, I believe the poll, if there was an election today, Pierre Polyev would win a whopping Landslide. Mulroney style majority. Yeah. Okay, there you have it. For those people who, who think that I, I, I have dementia, I'm completely out of it, I'm completely drunk or, or stoned or whatever. No, I agree. If there's an election today, Polyev wins. By the way, that's why there's not an election today. That's why it's going to wait for quite a long time. Obviously, one of the cool things about, you know, people knowing that you're here on a recurring basis, the first episode of every week, people get ahead of it. We get a lot of emails. People want us to read them to you. Some of them not so generous. This one from John came in after you posted your viral video over the weekend. This is Real Talker John. He says, I saw a video that Charles Adler did mocking and ridiculing Polyev's efforts to put the spotlight on affordability. I think Charles is losing the plot a little when he becomes such a partisan. While there is lots to be concerned about when it comes to Polyev, the role of opposition in Canada is to oppose the government. And on this count, Polyev is brilliant. He was way ahead of the general population and the government on affordability issues. If not for Pierre, Trudeau would continue roaming the world, virtue signaling on social issues. Now, this to you. He says, Charles, to say he's not attacking any Canadian's politics, you are, Charles. You're forgetting politics at the grassroots is about hope. And many Canadians have lost hope in the liberals. And then he takes a bit of a swipe here. He says his whole thing from Chuck is a little rich considering he found it was smart to platform Theo Fleury for years. A parting shot from John, and I wanted to give you a shot to respond to it. Uh, by the way, I love uh, Theo Fleury. Uh, I love Theo Fleury, even though he clearly, at the moment, uh, does not uh, love me, wants to hate on me and, and all the rest of it. Um, Theo Fleury uh, inspired me for many, many years. Uh, one, because I was a hockey fan, and two, because of um, a lot of work I did in the sexual child abuse area, and I think Theo Fleury gave a lot of people hope. I absolutely agree with John. Hope matters. And uh, don't dump on Theo Fleury because on a very, very significant issue, this is pre-COVID, pre-anti-vax, pre-all that stuff, uh, Theo Fleury was one of the, the best, not just in this country, but in any country, giving sexual child abuse uh, survivors reason for hope and saying that uh, they were not about being victims. They were about being victors. They overcame and they overwhelmed and so I, I, I have zero regrets about uh, uh, supporting Theo Fleury. Uh, as, as far as uh, Polyev is concerned, he is doing a magnificent job. I just said it again. The reason I was laughing was because I was laughing at just how, what a magnificent job he had done on Canadians. That they have actually been persuaded that life becomes much better. And that's why I said if, if, if Canadians really do believe this, uh, like hardcore believe it, well, why aren't they marching on Ottawa? Why aren't they demanding that, that that Justin Trudeau take a walk in the snow? I mean, if you honestly believe that you will have many thousands of dollars in your pocket at the end of the year that you don't have now, that, that Christmas will be merrier, the sun will be sunnier. I'm not being sarcastic here. I'm just being straightforward, plain speaking, common sense, you name it, me. If you really believe that, demand Demand that the prime minister resign to to to, to liberate you to give yourself a, a better life. I, mean, I, it, uh, I, I don't I, I don't know how deeply uh, I don't know how deep the belief is. I I have no sense of how convicted people are, but I I do believe that if there's an election today, Trudeau loses badly. No, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously. The, this from Randy in the live chat, by the way, he says he says O M G the carbon tax. Randy says, I love the carbon tax because I use the money from my rebate to add solar panels and new windows, a heat <laughs> pump. I don't know what Randy's rebate looks like. The guy's getting like 75 grand. But he says a heat pump, he says it saves us so much more than what we pay into the carbon tax. That from Randy. I mean, this is we're not going to go down this rabbit hole right now. We will talk about uh, the impact of the carbon tax on business with Shauna Feth from Alberta Chambers in just a minute. I want to ask you about something that this is a lot of people have been talking about this. I spoke to the premier directly about this. Uh, I would say off the record, but off air. Uh, she and I were attending an event together last week at a top 40 under 40 event. And I said, hey, premier, 
she was she was leaving in the morning uh, to you're call the premier now. You're, okay, hey premier. Uh, well, I mean, like if you know, if in the in the <laughs> okay, proper just, context, I, I'm not calling her Danny. Uh, but no, 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 I, I know. You know, just, yeah, just, like we have a we, we, we both know her and we call her Danielle. No, it is yes, like in public. I would call her premier. I'm just I, presenting this in reputable I'm, fashion. I'm, I'm presenting I'm this, you know, on the show you in know, reputable. Fashion. Something happens when you put the jacket on, man. Yeah, something happens. Yeah, fair. You know, you, you don't have to tell more, me that. You become a little more formal. Yeah, you can ask Johnny. It's a little, it's a little more casual yeah. Monday yeah. in here. Yeah. Once you're a little we more wrap sophisticated today than you were last Monday. Yeah, why is that? What was yeah. last Monday? I don't remind yeah, maybe, me. Maybe hang on. I'll, I'll put on the jacket because I need he's to. Gonna go, Charles is going to go put on a jacket because he's going to prepare to speak about the premier. Oh, uh, a heads up to to real talkers. <laughs> Look at this. You just has it on standby. You just have like your jacket. Oh, is Wait, this for when you do your own show? Oh, there it is. There you go. Looking sharp. Well tailored. Yeah. He's got the jacket. So We're I says, now, brother. So I says, hey Danny. Um, hey Danny. I said, I said, uh, you're being Yo, criticized. Premier. Yo, Premier. I said you're being widely Premier. criticized for taking a hundred people to Dubai, for taking a hundred people to COP uh, to the yeah. climate summit. And she said, what? She said, a hundred people. She says, we're taking like six. And I said, well, who are you taking? And she says, well, it's me. It's Minister Schultz. It's my, you know, executive director of comp, whatever. She goes through it. Mm -hmm. And then people yeah. keep, since I shared that last week, uh, a lot of people are coming at me and saying, no, 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 here's the list. Here's the, here's the entire Canadian delegation. So I want to get into this with you, but I want to do it in a real way. Okay, real talk, no bullshit. I can, you know, and this is how I see it. So I'm not going to read through the whole list of 100 because that would be boring. Yeah. Nobody wants to yeah. listen to that. But here's like who's represented. You know, I'm not going to say people's specific names. You can find this spreadsheet or whatever this yeah. is anywhere online. But like these are the, where these people are from. Okay, so you've got like Invest Alberta. Inotech, Alberta, Métis Nation of Alberta, Alberta Securities Commission, Alberta Innovates, Alberta Industrial Heartland Association, Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, Emissions Reduction, Alberta, and, and the list goes on. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, there's Premier's office. There's some sheriffs there, obviously, providing protection for the Premier. Her husband is there, which I know is, you know, a lot of people are getting pissed off at. Let me ask you this, though. Like, in all reality, if people were able to take they're sort of like partisan leanings out of this. Okay, if you like Danielle Smith, you really like her. If you don't like her, you really don't like her. If you think Rachel Notley's the greatest, you think she's really the greatest. And if you can't stand her, if you think Rachel Notley's the worst premier in Alberta's history, probably nobody's going to change your mind. But let me suggest this. If Rachel Notley was taking 100 people, or if Alberta was sending a delegation of 100 people to Dubai for COP, the message from the left, from the progressives, would be, look at this. Alberta's, you know, Canada's energy capital. And Canada's energy capital is taking climate so seriously that we're sending 100 people to COP to send a very clear message. We're investing in the future of industry in light of what needs to happen around a meaningful response to climate change. But if a conservative government or if the province of Alberta with all of its agencies and commissions and organizations is sending a delegation of this size to COP under a conservative government, all of a sudden it's bloated spending, it's wastage, it's, it's, it's partisan appointments, it's nepotism, it's all the things. Agree or disagree? Did she tell you that she was only taking six people? She told me that her delegation is six. Well, how does six become a hundred, and how does that not become untrue? Well, I'm like, do you, like, is, is well, I'm and I'm not the premier spokesperson, but I'm just using like straight up common well, no, sense. Well, she, like, she has a she has a reputation. Like, but Ryan, think, like, she has a reputation for not telling the truth. Sure, if but, she isn't telling you the truth, why aren't you upset about that? Well, well, how do you know she's not telling me the truth? Like, do you think well, no, that I'm is just, the premier well, saying, holding the hand she, of the leader of the Alberta Investment Marketing Corporation to their well, meetings? Just, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just asking questions here. Are, are all of those people that you mentioned on the list, and that's just a, a small part of it, Yeah. are they getting a freebie or are they attending on their own dime? That, that's my simple well, question. I would imagine that you know if you're there with the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, you're going there under your budget. I asked, I mean, here I asked the, uh, the you know Alberta's official opposition health critic David Shepard to his face yeah. at the same event. I said, "Who's the official opposition sending to COP?" He says, "We can't afford that." I said, "What do you mean you can't afford it?" He says, "Well, it's not a priority." He says, "Based on our budget, it doesn't make sense." So the NDP could have sent people to COP, but they chose not to. Is that Daniel Smith's decision? No, it's Rachel Notley's I just, I would, decision. I would just like to I would just like to find out how many people on that list are being paid by the Alberta government. Is the Alberta government picking up the freight for them, whether it's hotels, hotels and, and transportation? I just don't know. And she told you that she's only taking six. So I'm just wondering if the truth is somewhere 
in the middle. Yeah, maybe, maybe. so less the than premiers, 100, but much more than six. But okay, but it, it, it's not. It's disingenuous. To, and I already understand what all the critics are going to say, but it's disingenuous to suggest that somebody that's attending to represent the Métis Nation of Alberta is part of Daniel Smith's delegation. No, they're not. But they are one of approximately 100 people from Alberta going. And if people don't like the list, then you tell me. Should Alberta not be sending representatives to COP? No, and if Alberta's said, not sending just, representatives just, to COP, then I, I, what's the message? Alberta doesn't I, I, care about climate change. I'm just curious about whether or not the public is paying for it, whether Danielle Smith calls it her delegation or not. Who cares? I think it's a lot of money if the public is paying for it. Why, why don't we all of a sudden care about that? For years, we've been talking about the public picking up the dime, and now all of a sudden it doesn't matter. So we don't think me. that we should be sending representatives to international no, climate that's not, change that's conferences? Not my, that's not my point at all. My point is she told you that her, that she's only based, that her, her implication was that she was only committed to taking six people. And I think she's probably taking a whole lot more than six people. And I think some of those names are on the list. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. I'll move on from that. Um, you're asking. We don't have to move on. I'll I'll be happy to talk about that. I just think that there's a lot of hypocrisy from people here that if Rachel Notley was taking a big delegation, they would think it was awesome. I'm not disagreeing with you. I just, I I am just getting a little tired and maybe a little sick and tired of being tired of constantly hearing Danielle Smith trimming. And I got the impression from you, Mm. my good friend, Brian, that she gave you the impression that her delegation consists simply of six, implying that the, that the provincial government is only paying for six. And my, my hunch, based on what you're telling me and what the list is, is that Albertans are paying for a lot more than six. Should Albertans be going to a climate conference? Of course they should. If the NDP were in government, they would be probably taking just as many people and they would be crowing about it as precisely as you said. They'd be talking about this proves Alberta's uh, commitment uh, to studying climate change and doing what we can to alleviate climate change. I, I agree with you. There, there is hypocrisy there. So I think that what but we've also, decided I, here I is that you and I are both right. Yes, we're, we're, we're both right. But hypocrisy interests me, but deceit repels me. Yeah. Uh, Kirk says, good point. Jespo, you always have a great way of flushing out the woke left. Noob, try again, says Chuck has a fair point of who's taking care of the bill. Ryan also has a point that Danielle or the premier should have been more clear. And Mark Doran, uh, we just love having Mark in the live chat and on the show. The founder of the Pluto Pay Federation says attendance at a climate conference does not necessarily mean one has attended for climate reasons. And Mark's not wrong. I would suggest that a lot of Alberta's investment managing folks, a lot of those from the Industrial Heartland Association, and I'm not certain. Not speaking on their behalf, but I would suspect that they're also there to do some business. Also, not the worst thing in the world. So we'll see what happens from this. We're going to get voices from COP, but I just wanted to touch on that, and I wanted to touch on it with you because I suspected you might push back, and I thought we could have a good conversation. But I look at a lot of the criticism that Alberta's facing for going to COP, and I'm rolling my eyes so hard I'm getting a migraine. Well, uh, let me let me, let me me just say, say this as well. Uh, Dubai. It's a hell of a place to have a party, and you and I are going to party in Dubai one night. Yeah, we can invite and, what's and, his face and the, Leonard, and you can I, buy him a drink. But I, all, but I also want to say the taxpayers of Alberta will, will not pay for Ryan and Chuck having drinks in Dubai. Correct. They won't pay for anything because we are a free market, independent media organization that's not getting a single dime from the feds. Charles, we love you. We'll talk to you in a week. I love you, and I love your jacket. Thanks, pal. Yours too. That's Charles Adler, host of the Charles Adler Show. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. I mean, what's the big deal here? I get it. A hundred people on a plane. I get it. But number one, to me, it's like it's not a vacation. Like I, I like that they roll in and in the background is like, da, 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 here we come. Cop. It's like we're representing. We're Alberta, right? Alberta um, in the grand scheme. Well, we are Canada's we energy capital. Have the I'm, most not, I'm not trying to insult anybody. Yeah. I'm not insul- insulting the, the men and women that work so hard. We're about to talk to Shauna Fath, who, who looks out for thousands mm-hmm. of entrepreneurs uh, full time as president and CEO of the Alberta Chambers of Commerce. But let me say this like, the numbers don't lie when it comes to the, 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 the millions of barrels that Alberta produces every day or every week mm-hmm. uh, and what we contribute on the global stage. We are a small 
player. Mm -hmm. We're a small player compared to like the Saudis, these um, the Americans, like all these other nations. Yeah. And it's important for Alberta to be here. It's also important for Alberta to take climate conferences seriously. 100%. So like I said, all these people that are bitching about like I understand you want to you want to litigate is it six with the premier? Well, is the number six? Well, should she be taking her husband? I, I don't know. Should we make it, you know, more more reason like should Joe Biden have Dr. Jill Biden with him when he travels? Well, that's what I, don't I was going to say. Should, when the prime minister was married should the prime minister have sophie gregoire trudeau with him mm -hmm. should, should we try to make life miserable for our uh, world leaders or should they maybe be able to travel with their spouses i don't know should danielle smith the premier be on the hook or should she include in her six the delegation her security detail uh, do we believe that the premier of alberta should not have a security detail so she could be egged and have paint thrown at her by demonstrators like all this type of stuff people will say stephen harper flew his armored limousine over to this you know stephen harper what happens if you know i don't even want to say it out loud but what happens if there's an incident and then people say the rcmp didn't send over his armored car are you nuts what is canada we're counting pennies we're sending our prime minister our premiers to the super eight to save 94 dollars like i recognize and listen affordability is a real thing we talked about the affordability crisis. We did an amazing roundtable called Broke recently. You can find it in our archive. We take the issue seriously. But I saw Lou in our live chat that says, hey, I can't even afford to go to Mexico. Sure. And Lou, that sucks. And, and I hope that in the next couple of years, you go to Costa Rica. Uh, but listen, you can't compare that to a government doing business on the international stage. This mm -hmm. is apples and oranges. Oh, must be nice to be able to go to Dubai. This is the premier of the economic engine of Canada. These people mm -hmm. need to give their heads a shake. Yeah. You're getting fired up about Well, I this. am fired but up I was because starting I've seen that, that. <laughs> that whole thing I was starting was I was just going to say, I don't get why people get mad when each other's partners come with them. I, I think if you're a leader of a province, of a country, your partner should always be there regardless for support. So I don't get when people are like, why does their husband go or why does, you know, this person's partner always go with them. They should always be. There I understand that. You always. Know, Allison Redford is not the most popular premier in Alberta's <laughs> history. That's for sure. But one of the things that drove me nuts, and let's be clear, there was a problem. And by a problem, we mean they were lying mm -hmm. on her flight manifests. Okay. So when she was flying uh, at that time, I think if I, if memory serves correctly, I can't remember who sold Alberta's jets. Was it Prentice? Anyway, Alberta used to own Jets. Mm -hmm. and so the premiers could fly around. Ralph Klein used to love the Jets because he could smoke on the planes when he traveled. <laughs> but people got pissed off, number one, and rightfully so, because there was there was deceit on the flight manifest. They were saying that like cabinet ministers were flying on the on the plane when they weren't. They weren't even on the plane. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. But you know what wasn't a problem, and it was made to be a problem because people pile on when they're pissed off, was that Allison Redford was flying with her daughter. The premier is traveling with her daughter, and Albertans are picking up the tab for Allison Redford's daughter to fly with her mom. Well, yeah. The same people are bitching that women don't want to go into politics. Mm -hmm. Why don't women, a lot of times, we talk about these barriers to politics. I don't speak on behalf of women, obviously, but what are one of the reasons? What's one of the reasons? It's because women oftentimes are more hardwired to want to be a part of their kids' lives. And it's virtually impossible with the draw that demands on your time and on your life mm -hmm. for someone to be present with their family all the time and also be present as a demanding job like that requires. And it just infuriated me to see Alison Redford and in particular her daughter face fire from the general public just because they were pissed off, generally speaking, at the premier. I think we need a change of attitude on that front. Mm -hmm. We need to make politics more approachable, more family-friendly. You know, politicians in particular that are giving birth, for example, if they take, like, you look at these mat leaves that they take, they're like days. They're not weeks. They're not months. They come right back. And I'm not suggesting that in a four-year mandate, a politician should disappear for 12 or 18 months i think if you're in their constituency or if you know they were let's say for example a minister uh then that would obviously be a problem but we need to be reasonable and pragmatic in how we evaluate these types of things but listen maybe you think i'm drunk and stoned and senile just like charles and listen i'm not senile you can send us an email anytime to talk at Ryan Jesperson. I didn't say a word, Ryan. I didn't say a word. Uh, well, when I you mean, said our, that. Our, 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 <laughs> our party for all of our partners and, people, and sponsors was on Friday. So, people, you know, you are, never know. People are disagreeing with me here. Like, I feel like I've, I, I know that, you know, the, the president of the United States' wife doesn't go with him everywhere. 
But I feel like if you're going on somewhere and you need some support, I don't know why people get so bent out of shape when their spouses are there. But people on the text line saying, and I get it. You know, yeah. If, they, if they're not on a salary for the premier's office, maybe they shouldn't be there. I agree. Uh, Plain Power says, let's not compare lies between Danny and Redford. Between, <laughs> okay. Uh, David says the cost to bring you a spouse is basically nothing. It's one plane seat and maybe food. I mean, they'd be sleeping in the same room. Uh, Tracy says there are way worse ways for politicians to waste taxpayers' money than I agree. to have a traveling companion. Agree. Um, Shirley, uh, hey, Shirley's making a fair point here. Shirley says the trip is not just pro Alberta; it's anti Feds, anti Trudeau. That's what bothers me. Uh, and David says uh, I'd get stoned with you, Jespo. All right, David. Kimberly says I don't like you today. <laughs> That's okay. No problem. <laughs> Um, hey, listen, talk at RyanJesperson.com is where you can send us your emails. Maybe what we're doing is setting the table. You can't uh, like them every day. For, for a fired up. Johnny doesn't like me. I My wife like doesn't even day. like me every single day. <laughs> uh, the Flamethrower coming up on Friday, presented by the DQs of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Your chance to blow off a little steam, and maybe we've given you some material here. You can send us your Flamethrower, fire it up, send us your heat, tell us your beef by sending an email to talk at RyanJesperson.com. Alberta Chambers of Commerce President and CEO Shauna Feth in 60 seconds but right now we wanted to talk to you about complete care restoration this is the company that's doing unbelievable work when we talk about climate change and the impact on on businesses and what businesses want to do to lessen their environmental footprint complete care restoration we're going to be telling you about this through the month of december is leading industry in the province of alberta you know the majority of materials that are salvaged from a site, that are cleared from a site, let's say when there's been a big fire or a flood. We're talking about the, the ruined drywall, that disgusting saturated carpet, the underlay, the everything that comes out of there. You can picture it, right, going into the bins. You know what percentage of that is recycled on average? Well, the answer is zero. But guess what? With Complete Care Restoration, they have a system and they've made a commitment over the past few years. We're going to spell this out to you in the weeks to come, tell you a little bit more about it. On average, they are recycling 71% of the materials that they're clearing from disaster sites. 71% of it wow. is kept out of a landfill. It's unbelievable. That's, a lot. That's why we're proud to do business with them. You can find them online at completecarerestoration.ca. And before we get to Shauna Feth, I wanted to remind you that just because it's winter, just because we're finally seeing snow on the ground, it doesn't mean that the team at Eden Landscaping is hand, you know, hanging up their shovels and throwing their boots in the closet and just kicking up their feet for the next few months. Uh-uh. What they do now is they get into the design phase, the planning phase. They spend time with with their clients figuring out the perfect game plan so when spring hits and they're going to bring your outdoor space to life they're ready to go and sometimes supply chain issues means they've got to get the orders in weeks or even months in advance if you want your pergola your outdoor kitchen your water feature your retaining wall ready to go for that anniversary celebration that graduation party whatever it is next summer reach out today to eden landscaping at landscapeedmonton.ca the first Monday of every month, it's our pleasure to hang out with the president and CEO of the Alberta Chambers of Commerce. She's the one that has her finger on the pulse of where business is at in the province. And it's nice to see you again, Shauna Feth. Welcome to the studio. Thanks, Ryan. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, so the carbon tax pops up a little bit in our conversation uh, with Charles Adler. And I know that this is something uh, that's been really on your radar and, and, and the team at Alberta Chambers. Uh, what do we know, like numbers-wise, anecdotally, and otherwise, about the impact that the federal carbon tax is having on business right now? Yeah, so we just uh, partnered with our colleagues in the Atlantic provinces, in the Atlantic provinces, sorry, um, to represent about... 35,000 businesses in those two regions to uh, really share with the feds the impact that it's having. Um, the the pan-Canadian approach is really what's what's bothering us is how they're, you know, picking winners and losers in provinces in terms of how they're um, doling out relief, those types of things. And, you know, ironically, it's our Atlantic uh, colleagues that want to partner with us in that conversation. And the other part to it that we really wanted to uh, address is just the $1.6 billion that's sitting in that fuel charge proceeds return program that was supposed to be given back to businesses, and we're just not seeing it. So and what, what would be like, how would you like to see that? Just like if you were writing the policy, what would that look like? Like, what do you think would be the appropriate approach there? In terms of re re 
giving that money back. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would just say equal distribution in terms of contribution rates and where, where the, the, the money is coming from. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of our small businesses could use out those extra dollars in their coffers and they're facing a lot of challenges from an inflation perspective. Uh, could you uh, take us like behind the curtain? Could you tell us a bit about those conversations with, with your colleagues in Atlantic Canada? I mean, were they acknowledging that, I mean, do you think that they even felt the same way that some of the messaging coming from Western premiers like, like Smith and Mo? I mean, do, do they feel the same way? Do they acknowledge that there seems to be a disparity? Like, it's quite frankly unfair? Yeah, and, you know, that is the exact conversation we were having with them. And, and the other part to this is really putting the control back in the provincial and territorial jurisdictions. That's really another part that was critically important to us in this conversation with the feds around the carbon pricing. And so we, we definitely agree on that. I mean, they don't want to shoot themselves in the foot, but they definitely agree that, you know, there's got to be a better approach. And this pan-Canadian approach is just not working. Huh. This uh, Dow Chemical deal mm-hmm. is, uh, this project is a huge one. It's it's nearly like, I was just sort of anecdotal, you know, earlier just saying, like, it's like a 10 billion. It's not. It's like almost a $12 billion project. Um, obviously, you see, you see the different levels of government, municipal, provincial, and federal at that announcement, including uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland. It's obviously encouraging uh, to see a project of this magnitude and to see investment, uh, a high-profile investment, like this at a time where some of the conversation has been around the fact that a lot of people look around them, they say international developments and trends, and they go, well, we don't see a lot of like, you know, 9, 10, 11 figure, 12 figure investments Mm -hmm. in Alberta right now. Um, How long did you know this was coming? And when you saw the announcement, uh, where was your head at? I think you probably had the inside track on this before the rest of us. Yeah, no, we were hearing about it months ago for sure in terms of some of the you know different things that were going on in terms of trades and skilled labor and the things that were going to be needed to support the, a project of this magnitude. I mean, it's just incredibly positive news. I think the the big the really big news story is really it's the first of its kind you know in the world. It's a net zero petrochemical plant, and it's in Alberta. You know that's pretty that's that's the big headline really, and you know all of the jobs it's going to create. We're talking about. 8,000 jobs during construction and around 500 to 800 during when it's actually running. So yeah. it's pretty exciting for the region, that's for sure. I was trying to read up on it just a little bit so I could understand as I was talking to you. It's it's, it's an ethylene cracker uh, that they're building, which is an industrial facility that converts fossil fuels into usable products. Um, and, and it's expected that it'll grow Dow's ability to produce polyethylene, which is used for things like food containers, plastic bags. Uh, the government obviously is pouring billions of dollars of support into this through incentives and subsidies to fund construction on the site in Fort Saskatchewan, which is kind of northeast-ish of Edmonton. Uh, but this uh, amid Ottawa's continued fight to ban some single-use plastics. So I thought it was it was interesting, uh, the Supreme Court ruling against Ottawa's plastics ban. But here you have a story where plastics will be manufactured, but at a net zero facility. So it's, it's interesting. Like, I like when we as citizens have to challenge ourselves and say, it's probably not realistic. And I think that Canada's highest court agreed that the, the plastics ban was too sweeping, that they just were basically outlawing everything. And, and, and it wasn't, uh, I mean, it wasn't constitutional, but also for the average person probably didn't seem to make sense. But you have an acknowledgement here that the investment needs to be in something that lessens the footprint as much as possible, which seems to be good for all parties involved, good for business, good for the bottom line, the tax base, certainly, uh, but also, of course, good for the environment. It seems to be like a win on a number of fronts. Absolutely. And again, can't stress enough that, you know, you're looking at all levels of government partnering here in Alberta to bring this massive investment, one of the largest in our history. Uh, And I think that's a, a real win-win situation as well to just illustrate the fact that it can be done in our province there that level of collaboration can happen and it can happen on major issues like single plastics use and the announcement of such an incredible facility that's going to be eliminating that you know even with the carbon tax conversation it's never been an argument about you know needing to reduce emissions right always been an argument about How are we doing that in a fair way that's not having a huge impact on our businesses and our citizens? Well, and and it's not just business that's having those conversations right now. Like you look at the public conversation since, I mean, we did a whole episode last week just on heat pumps Mm -hmm. because people are trying to understand more about home heating oil and heat pumps and carbon taxes and how they're applied. And and maybe even the, the, you know, the, maybe the cracks in the foundation around this 
prime minister's office and and basically i think you could argue that the carbon tax has been trudeau's probably signature policy and you look now the government appears to be kind of contradicting itself in a way and so rightfully so you've got millions of people uh including just you know john and jill q public talking about the future of the carbon tax mm -hmm. so so a lot of people that may not have been paying attention to it before uh, people that want to see uh, you know uh, labor trends and mm -hmm. uh, the, the labor force statistics in alberta obviously we're talking here the first week of december um but we have our numbers now for october i'll punch the link in the show notes so people can see it but but what do we know about alberta's labor market and some of the trends through the month of october let's call it five weeks ago mm -hmm. yeah we added seventy eight thousand jobs that's you know amazing in terms of you know, it, it just speaks to that level of migration that we're seeing coming into the province as well, but that we're creating that many jobs is just very good news in terms of entrepreneurs are still still have the, you know, the, the want, the spirit to start new businesses, to grow new businesses, and they're, you know, they need the labor pool to do that, and, and we're seeing that trend up. You know, it's 3.5% it's 3 up over this time last year, so that's significant increase. Yeah, this is, like, how would you put it, like, 78,000 jobs obviously sounds like a ton is there is there a way to put that into i'm always i was like mm -hmm. comparisons or something like you know something is like that's like 10 hot tubs worth of water or that's mm -hmm. like three football fields size of a wildfire type idea Seventy eight thousand when it when it comes to unemployment that we've seen or under employment mm -hmm. that we've seen how many like months would you say ish of seventy eight thousand jobs added do we need like what what magnitude of what magnitude is that recovery generally speaking um, you know, I couldn't hazard a guess on I'm that. I'm putting right? you on the yeah, spot. Yeah, I couldn't hazard a guess on that. But what I would say is we were just talking about Dow. So that would be like 10 Dow chemical plants or 10 Dow Huge. plants being built in the province over the course of a month and needing the labor to support that, which is really quite, you know, when you think about it, it's kind of a little bit mind boggling to, yeah. to just think about that number. Another big one is that full-time positions are up too, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. people might say, well, what, where's the asterisk there? Is this just all part-time? And it's not. No. It's also worth pointing out that um, year over year, comparing October of 22 to October of 23, um, employment growth by province, like PEI is off the charts. <laughs> it is. I don't know what's going on there. Do you? But, but Alberta is number two. Yeah, which is great in the entire country. In the entire country, yeah, and and agreed. I don't know what's going on in PEI. Good for either. them. I mean, I'm that's gonna, great. I'm going to give my co colleague there a call and find out what yeah. they're doing. What are you up to over <laughs> yeah, there in Prince exactly. Edward Island? Maybe yeah. people are just figuring out how beautiful it is to live there. I don't know, but yeah. but Alberta number two, which is obviously a yeah. great news story, and for people that are curious, uh, Nova Scotia and Saskatchewan at three and four. Uh, people can check out what you and your team are doing. Uh, the Alberta Chambers of Commerce at abchamber.ca. Talk to me about this talent development symposium mm -hmm. that you just hosted. Yeah, really excited about it. Uh, we hosted it at the beginning of the month and uh, at the beginning of November. Really what it is is a partnership between us and the Alberta Post-Secondary Network. So uh, APSN represents the 28 post-secondary institutions across the province of Alberta. And what it is is just a accumulation of all of the work that we've been doing on the task force. So we brought together post-secondary institutions, industry, students, um, and anybody who has an interest in really developing a strategy for talent in the province that's like no other jurisdiction and being able to ensure that our post-secondary students are getting access to things like uh, work integrated learning opportunities that we're using research and data to really support um, the PSIs in terms of their future decision making in terms of where are the jobs going in the future and what do we need to be paying attention to so that we don't have shortages in critical areas. I mean two really big ones the last few years have been veterinarians and pilots and so we've seen huge announcements around those um, in terms of expanding the post-secondary space but if we could be doing that ahead of when we have a critical shortage that's really what we're trying to do with some of that labor and research we've and had a veterinarian shortage <laughs> yes you know they're just so healthcare we've only been focusing on the humans yeah we huge and veterinary aids for sure was a huge challenge in our province huh um, yeah absolutely. i think it's always interesting for people to know like what's happening behind the scenes mm -hmm. like what what do you what do chambers of what does the Alberta Chambers of mm -hmm. Commerce actually do besides like people know that you speak on behalf of business, you do a great job of like putting information together, but to hear this stuff behind the scenes mm -hmm. of, of actually what's happening on the policy front, I think is really valuable for a lot of people to better understand. Absolutely. And you know, talent is just, it's not going away and we need to be really looking to the future in terms of how are we making sure that students when they graduate have the, the 
experience that they actually need. That's one of the challenges we're hearing from our businesses is, you know, you've got this pool of just brilliant, talented uh, kids coming out of, well, I shouldn't call them kids, they're adults. I always say kids. I know, I know they're young adults. (laughs) Young adults coming out of of our post-secondaries, you know, highly intelligent, but just haven't had that opportunity to interact in a business environment or, you know, actually real world experience in whatever their chosen field is. So that's why, you know, the symposium, we had 20 of our, 20 out of 28 of our post-secondaries represented there. We had, as I said, we had all of these um, different groups in the room to have a real good chat about talent. Uh, we were really honored to have, um, you know, Minister Glubish and Minister Jones join us as well for that event. And again, it's just about let's let's build a strategy here in Alberta that's n- like none other and can really support our businesses and our communities in terms of the talent they need going mm. forward. It's cool that you've got the ministers working with you. It's mm-hmm. also cool. I heard you guys sold out your deputy minister's dinner. We did. For people that understand politics and, and, <laughs> and, and also just how government works and how governance works, um, the ministers are obviously important and influential, but the deputy ministers are also the ones that are kind of calling a lot of the shots behind the scenes, Mm -hmm. making it happen. They're the ones that aren't typically swapped out. Sometimes they are when government changes, but these are the, can I say the power brokers, power players a lot of times, and the ones that understand those portfolios as well. So cool to see uh, the Alberta Chambers, because didn't you take a few, I mean, COVID and all of the things considered, Mm -hmm. it had been a while since you hosted one of those, right? Yeah, it's the first one since 2019. Oh, wow. Yeah, and we sold out, which was fantastic. Uh, we had every single ministry represented, uh, every deputy minister there, or representative in some cases. We had some that were sick and weren't able to join sure. us and had somebody uh, somebody else come on on their behalf. But why that's so important is because it gives our businesses, it gives our chambers of commerce, everybody that's needing to talk to these individuals, the chance to get in front of them and actually sit down and have dinner with them. Yeah. Um, because when you have all of them there, that means that you actually can have a, mini- a deputy minister at every single table. Uh, and, and we let... Or the people that participate choose who they wanted to sit with, and for the most part, that's we were able cool. to accommodate that. So that's kind of a really unique in in terms of being able to get that level of access for that amount of time to really talk about the challenges and issues in your communities, with your business, with your industry, whatever the case may be. Totally. Yeah. So we're really excited. It sold out. It was a huge success. And um, yeah. I, I don't want to spoil anything. If your family members or close friends are watching this, but have you started your holiday shopping yet? Are you a person like? Do you do it in like? August or you do it on like December 24th? No, I actually, I, I shopped local in Killam when my, my uh, son was playing hockey on the weekend and nice. dropped some money for stocking stuffers and that's as far as I've gotten. Yeah. I was waiting for that hour in between, you know, <laughs> when you drop him off at the yeah. rink and you get to go watch. Uh, so, so I did actually start on the weekend, but it was just like some little stocking stuffer stuff. Nice. But I did get to, to drop some money in a local community. Well, I'm, I'm grateful for, for what you and your team have put together. This is a great resource. People can check out chambermarket.ca, which allows you, basically, it's a great way to be able to shop local everywhere. Can you talk to us a bit about this? Absolutely. So first of all, I would just say I I would urge everybody, please support your local communities, your local businesses. Uh, Get out and spend your money in your communities. If you are, you know, committed to shopping online, (laughs) we do have a a local solution as well in chambermarket.ca. Uh, we have about 40 communities represented there and, uh, you know, well over th- thousands of products and several ve- several hundred vendors on, on the site. So if you are going to shop <laughs> online, uh, that's a really great way to still do it locally and find vendors in your own community where you can, um, you know, elect, you know, do the e-commerce thing, but still support local. I love it. And, and it's not just some like, I, I, let me say, it's not just some, you know, basic website template where you just link to a bunch of businesses there's like featured products Mm -hmm. for people you can you can go online and kind of window shop which is really neat some beautiful art really cool stuff from from vendors and and entrepreneurs all across the province again that's chambermarket.ca and and of course you can always learn more about what they're doing at the alberta chambers of commerce by checking out their website abchamber.com Dot ca. I guess the next time that you and I hang out, is, it's going to be 2024. I know. Wow. Hey. I'm looking forward to it. We'll I don't do know like where a, the last year went. No, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's flown to be sure. But um, we're grateful for this opportunity to check in with you and kind of this allows us to make sure as well as a show and editorially speaking that we're focusing on where the province is at with actual numbers, informed insight, and we're grateful for that. So thanks for making time to join us in studio today, Shauna. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thanks, You got Ryan. it. That's the president and CEO of the Alberta Chambers of Commerce. That's Shauna Feth. 
where are you at right now, pal? When, uh, and again, I don't know if, if your partner's watching this. I don't want to sort of spoil <clears> anything, <throat> but are you uh, all set up with your holiday shopping, or are you a last-minute kind of a guy? No, Ryan, and thank you for shining <laughs> a big spotlight on that. Well, I, I have not. I curious. Yeah, and usually I get like, like Shauna, I, I usually have like these stocking stuff taken care of. Uh, right now, though, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking. Yeah. I don't want to be that guy, but I might have to. I'm, I'm obviously going to go support local. I always get a bunch of local things. My yeah. partner's really into that, but I might, I might have to get a few things on Amazon just last minute. <laughs> yeah, you just, just, you just need just to, to like fill the gap. Next day delivery. <laughs> I always think it's one of those, uh, and that's what I love about this Alberta uh, or the chamber market thing that they've put together, which mm. is, is a great resource as well. But for me, it's always like I need to go to a like a farmer's market or a craft fair yeah. or something. You get a lot of things. Because there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of items that you wouldn't otherwise think of. You may mm -hmm. not even know they exist, but yeah. when you see it, you're like, that's it. Exactly. You, don't want, you want to get some original stuff, right? Yeah. You want to get some things where we're like... You know, there's only six of these they made. I totally. saw it at the market or whatever, right? Or there's but like little, there's like little sort of, uh, you know, I, I think of like we get like a custom uh, leather or something done or a certain type yeah. of soap or something. And you can see the, the imperfections which make it so perfect mm -hmm. because it's handmade. And I don't know, you just sort of can't manufacture that stuff. I love it. So what are, what are the kids feeling? Are they feeling Christmassy at home right now? Or are they? Oh man! I know why so it's we, a big Christmas guy. But we decorated what about the, the tree yesterday, and and little <laughs> Noah Bear. So he's Noah. Noah turned eighteen months over the weekend. So he's a year and a half. Um, took. I, I don't know if we're. I haven't. I haven't asked Carrie yet if we're officially categorizing it as baby's first steps. But wow. he, he took four steps in a row yesterday toward the Christmas tree. So <laughs> I think. Right, uh, he I knows know. where the goods are. He knows where the goods are, and he was just intrigued by it. It's it's one of these flocked trees, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. So it looks like yeah. it snowed onto the tree, yeah. and so he was just like wide eyed and the white lights, and he just thought it was amazing. But yeah. but four, do you think four steps in a row? I think that is that's baby's first steps, isn't uh, it? Yes, I think so. Was he fully upright? Oh yeah, oh, no yeah. help. Fully upright, no help. Four steps in a row, and then onto his keister. So did you get a video? Oh, there's, all, all we do is shoot video. <laughs> We've got cameras all, all over we, the we house. We have cameras all over the house. <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, we do have cameras all over the house. But uh, yeah, no, it was yeah, it was really exciting and, and uh, really special time. Um, every Monday, or uh, we wrap up our first episode of every week. Uh, we focus on a story that has just warmed our hearts. A story that's I don't know sometimes restored our faith in humanity. It's courtesy of our friends at Kubi Renewable Energy. And this is where we remind ourselves that there are positive things happening. We get rid of the negativity for a couple of seconds and, and we renew our faith in humanity, courtesy of Kubi Renewable Energy. And this one is from Karen. I absolutely love this. Karen wrote this in to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Uh, Johnny, by the way, she says she's been a listener since the very beginning of Real Talk for three years and counting now. She says, I've had a couple of back wow. in the day trash talks read. She had a couple of her trash talks read. She says, but this is my very first positive reflections. Absolutely love it, Karen. She's on holiday in Mexico right now, and she still tunes into the show every single day, which blows our mind. We're so grateful for that, Karen. She says, have you seen the story of the, Cana uh, the Canadian retirement community? It's the Colonel Belcher retirement residence that's hosting the New Zealand curling team. And I said, what? I said, what are you talking about? Well, so it turns out, she sends us the link. You can see it at worldcurling.org. How great is this? Among the 175 permanent tenants in Calgary at the Chartwell Colonel Belcher Retirement Residence, there's four curlers from New Zealand that are living there as well. So they, they needed a place to stay, and they're in Calgary for months as they train Okay, so the, I mean, the, the, the New Zealand flag had not flown at the World Men's Curling Championship for more than 10 years until the 2023 competition that was in Ottawa when they qualified. And this was an absolutely huge deal. A fifth place finish at the Pan Continental Curling Championships secured their spot in the Worlds. And so here's the deal. They needed somewhere to stay. They figured that staying in Canada would benefit their development. There'd be better ice to play on. They'd have elite level opposition to compete against. And so, because the budget was relatively modest, they put out the call for maybe an appropriate living situation. Well, they got about 150 responses to a Facebook post in just 12 hours, and a whole bunch of those linked them to a consultant for Chartwell's Colonel Belcher retirement residence named Cassandra Murray. She reached out to them and she said, we think it would be a perfect fit. 
And so now, as we speak, the curlers, the rink, the New Zealand rink, are living in this retirement community with 175 other residents. They eat dinner with them. They watch TV with them. They hang out. They've made 175 new friends. And of course, the residents have made four or five new friends themselves. It's an absolutely fantastic story. We love this. The different generations coming together. And we're so grateful, Karen, that you took the time out of your Mexican vacation to pass this along. Indeed, this is a positive reflection you can get a quote on free solar or pardon me you can get a free oh. quote on solar jake's gonna get in touch with me sorry did you promise free solar <laughs> the quote is free the solar is not but it'll pay for itself in 10 years we can guarantee you that at kubienergy.ca we've got a whole lot more real talk coming up this week we're going to get into the news that matters and of course what you think about it we welcome your feedback after each and every show, and we thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson, executive producer Josh Dunford, 